Good morning. Welcome to the July 18th worship service of Shelbyville First United Methodist Church, the Church on the Square. We welcome everyone viewing the service on Facebook Live, those listening on WLIJ AM and FM, and everyone here in the sanctuary. Our pastor is the Reverend Dr. Paul H. Mulliken. His message this morning is titled, The God of Compassion. The lay liturgist is our director of student ministries, Ashley Porter. Musicians are Rebecca Baker, Lori Schuler, and John Brock. We appreciate the technical assistance of Wayne Crowell, John Carney, Rachel Swift, and Jeannie Phillips. The flowers in the chancel area are presented to the glory of God by Carol and Carrie O'Brien in honor of Ashley Porter and the youth of First United Methodist Church, and they are indeed beautiful. The white flower is in memory of our dear member, Barbara Green, who this week joined the church triumphant. The choir robes in the chancel area are in memory of both Helen Collier and Barbara Green, who were both faithful and dedicated members of our chancel choir and who will never be forgotten. In the calendar, uh, we need to make mention, Ashley is going to be at Lakeshore this week, so there will not be UMYF tonight, and there will not be uh, Wednesday activities for the youth this week. Tomorrow evening, two important meetings, the Caring and Connecting Team meets at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, and then at 6 p.m. tomorrow night, the Staff Parish Relations Committee will meet uh, here at the church. Next Sunday, right after the worship service, the worship team will have a meeting here in the sanctuary. August is going to be a fun month, uh, a lot of great worship, and part of that is going to be singing your favorite hymns uh, during August. And you'll notice in your bulletin there is an insert for you to write the name of your favorite hymn. And even more importantly, we'd like to know why that is your favorite hymn. What is the meaningfulness of that hymn in your life, in your spiritual journey? And we'll look forward to sing, singing those in the month of August. There are, I believe, are boxes in the Narthex area that you can drop these in. So please let us know your favorite hymn. At this time, I'd like to call on my good friend, Irby Simpkins, to come make some, an important announcement. Thank you, John. And thank all of you for being here today. Uh, I'm appearing in this position, which is not usual for me, as your lay delegate to the Tennessee Annual Conference. This was an important conference because it's the last meeting of the Tennessee Annual Conference uh, as it is while we were in this meeting. And, and I want to dispatch the mystery about this conference. I want to tell you that the word schism, which I didn't know before the conference, which means to change or alter a church or a religion, uh, was only mentioned in a prayer of relief during the entire conference. This conference had important business. It had important business of, uh, first of all, lending a hand to the Methodist Church that was desperately needed for Martin College. Martin College is now going to become a division of the University of Tennessee. I'm sorry, it is a division of the first uh, uh, of the Tennessee uh, University. I, um, have, that's had special meaning for me uh, because I was on the board of Martin Methodist College for a long time during my life. And I think that the geniuses who came up with this idea uh, uh, was good for the Methodist Church, it's good for our conference, uh, and it is going to be great for the students of Southern Middle Tennessee. 
Um, the second thing that happened in the conference that was, was very important was finalizing the um, merger between the Memphis and the uh, Tennessee conference. Now, I, I, I will tell you that Brother Paul deserves to go, uh, claim some credit for that since the Memphis conference is his home conference. And he is, of course, been a minister in the Tennessee conference. This merger is important to us at First Methodist Church Shelbyville because we are all Methodist and the, the merger is enabling um, much greater efficiencies, um, much uh, more communication, and we bring in our brothers and sisters from Western Kentucky um, to round that out, which gives us a much better footprint uh, for our faith and for our uh, operations of the United Methodist Church. I want to tell you that um, I only met Bishop uh, McAlealy one time, and that was when I sat behind him when he gave an address here in our church. And so I was very curious uh, about uh, what a bishop uh, kind of unrolled, you know, because this was his, this was, thank you, Paul. This was his responsibility time uh, to 643 Zoom viewers uh, of the meeting. And, and, um, and I want to tell you that they brought that off, the conference office did, with a wonderful result. Um, the, the business of the conference, I, I'm not going to bore you with particularly, but I did want to give you an overview of um, what's really going on at the conference level that's important uh, to us. And the bishop emphasized this. Uh, now, now, some of this is not good news, and so I want you to be prepared for that. Seven churches were disaffiliated during the time period uh, of the last, uh, between uh, this conference and the last one. Four churches were closed. Membership stands now at 106,229, and that's down 3,275 from the previous year. Worship attendance starts at 30,322 in person, 52,884 online. Uh, that's down uh, uh, 47,832. Now, of course, you know I'm giving you all COVID numbers. Church school attendance stands at 14,244, and that's down 5,481. Professions of reaffirmation of faith are down uh, for 2020, uh, 545, down 931 from 2019. Young adults and adults in small groups met in 2020, 21,590, down 7,118. So there's a lot of work we've got to do to meet Jesus' challenge. The rest of what happened at the conference was recognizing the history of the Methodist Church, and if you would like to see those vignettes, uh, the conference office will give you the uh, computer setting and you can view them on your computer, all of them. If you want to see the whole conference, they have that on computer for you to view. And there should be no more mystery about what's happening in our church. The bishop made four sermons during the six hours that we met. And those four sermons were about being what's important, Christians building disciples for Christ. And so I, as your representative, 
um, voting every time we had a chance to vote, but we weren't voting on any of the issues that you had thought about uh, that was on the news, that was on the internet, uh, because none of that pertained to the uh, building of the Tennessee-West Kentucky Conference or the merger of University of Tennessee with Martin College. Um, all of the Methodist affiliations with Martin College were preserved. Uh, the churches that gave scholarships to students who went to Martin College, uh, the, the endowment goes to, with the university. The, um, uh, those scholarships can only be granted uh, to uh, students who are Methodist. And so uh, I am proud to tell you that I came away from this conference, which I worried Paul to death about, uh, having never done it before. But I will tell you that because of the reputation and the good work of John Carney and Paul in our conference, um, I was received well, <laughs> way beyond my qualifications. If there's any questions that you have that I haven't touched on, uh, there is a uh, online access to the conference office all the time. Everything that I have told you is in print online. And, and, and so, we can go forward as members of First United Methodist Church without mystery anymore. I thank you. Thank you so much, Irby. We appreciate your uh, representing our church. And now let us prepare our hearts to worship our compassionate Savior.
Let us pray. As we worship this morning, O God, we pray that your spirit will be our strength, your word will be our guide, your love will be our comfort, and your promises will be our hope. We gather now to praise you, O God, in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you are able as we share responsibly our call to worship, which you will find posted in your bulletin or on the church website. We gather today seeking the peace Christ gives. We gather in spite of many a conflict, many a doubt. We gather longing for the breath of God's Spirit to give us courage and renewal. We are like sheep without a shepherd. Come, Christ Jesus, and lead us home again to you. Let us join together in singing, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. the spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love, as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end of the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Continue in a spirit of prayer. I 
to call your attention to our prayer concerns listed in our bulletin. We hope and pray that you will keep these people in your hearts and your prayers, not only today, this morning, but throughout the week. This has been an, an interesting week uh, for all of us, and we pray that God would just guide us as we move forward. Uh, I'm so thankful that Barb and I had an opportunity to go earlier this week to North Carolina so that we could spend some time with our youth and, and visit this little house that got there in Nashville called the Biltmore. Uh, and uh, it was a good time to fellowshipping with our youth as well. We appreciate Ashley and her uh, efforts in, in working with our youth and uh, with our children. You may notice some very colorful shirts around the, uh, the, the sanctuary today. This was from the tie-dyeing uh, project that Ashley did with our children and youth, and, and we got even some young at heart folks that have done that as well. So we're glad to, to appreciate all of what Ashley has done. Uh, be in prayer for Ashley this week. She will be the dean of the elementary, one of the elementary camps at Lakeshore. And so pray that God would give her the strength and the wisdom to, to lead that group. Um, I used to actually serve as a dean of elementary camps. At first, I didn't think that was an important job, and then I realized the elementary camp is the first time most of these campers come to camp, and it's a make-or-break time. It's a time that you can win them over to the joys of church camp, or if you don't do it right, they won't ever come back again. So I know that Ashley is going to just open up her hearts to these children and that God would make a difference in their lives. We especially want to keep in our prayers the family and friends of Barbara Green. She died quite unexpectedly this past Wednesday. She had been having some heart issues through the weekend and had gone to the hospital to tend to that, and while she was having physical therapy, she had another heart attack and was not able to be revived. The arrangements are still pending, and as soon as we have some information about that, we'll try to get the word out to you through our One Call Tell-All. If you have not received the One Call Tell-All, it's either one of things you didn't sign up, or sometimes we're having problems with it all going through. So let our church office know that if you did not receive a One Call Tell-All, and we'll do our best to try to correct those issues. I'm so thankful for folks like Diana Agnew and Bill Petkovich who gave of their time to serve in Barbara's place as our church receptionist. Please let us know if you're willing to offer your services in that same way. Uh, it really helps the church staff to do its work faithfully and having someone to respond to the door and to answer the calls. Uh, Barbara was also so great at taking over the task of keeping our church bulletin board with the news uh, uh, up to date. And so we'll be looking for someone who will kind of take that on as their ministry as well. I'm so thankful for the prayers. Those of you who are on Facebook, and uh, you might have noticed that I had requested prayers for a young man, Josh Martin. He was at my camp just a few weeks ago. And Josh has been a longtime Camp Joy camper, a just a delightful young man. And he, he is going to his vacation Bible school in West Tennessee. And he had some issues where he just fell out on the floor and, uh, and he got to be unresponsive. And so they took him to the St. Thomas West and he, they had to replace and put a new shunt to relief, relieve some pressure on his brain from the seizures that he was having. But praise God, uh, the surgery went well on Thursday and he should have gotten home yesterday. I, I haven't confirmed that yet with his mom. But uh, I'm, I'm grateful for your prayers for him. Uh, we need to offer some prayers for others this, in this coming week especially. Tomorrow, Paul Cross is with us today. We'll be having uh, another spinal surgery at Vanderbilt in Nashville. So let's keep Paul in our prayers. And then Tuesday, I believe it is, uh, David Seagrove will be having surgery on his knee uh, at Vanderbilt Bedford locally here. So we want to keep those folks in our prayers as well. Uh, we continue to watch the COVID, active COVID cases in our county, and they fluctuate between the single digits, and now we're up to 16, and that was as of Friday the, uh, the 16th. So let us keep watching out for one another and keep loving each other. Remember that we as Methodists are called to do no harm, but to do good, make a difference in this world. So let us uh, keep these in our prayers. If you have other requests, please let us know, and we'll be glad to do all we can to include those in our list in the upcoming Sundays. But for now, let us, our spirit be one with God's spirit as we go to God in prayer.
good and generous God, in Christ Jesus you came to us, promising life and abundance. So we give you thanks today for all the abundant gifts that we have received through him, the assurance of your love day by day, the relief of having your mercy when we recognize our own failings, hope to sustain us when things seem oh so bleak, and peace, an abiding peace that comes when we trust ourselves to your eternal keeping. These are the gifts that really matter, O oh God. So for all of these gifts and all of these other blessings that you have poured out into our lives, we, uh, and we recognize these and, and we give thanks to you because our lives uh, are so much better because you're in our lives. Generous God, today we, we pray for all whose lives seem so empty of joy because the going is tough and friends sometimes seem so far away. Because their hearts are filled with disappointment. Because their sorrow and grief are, are especially keen this day. Support each one in your abundant compassion. Generous God, we remember before you those whose lives are empty of peace and hope. Because they're struggling. Struggling with illness or disability. Because they feel so powerless in the face of violence and other forces beyond their control. Send your peace and your promise with signs of new possibility and real hope. Generous God, we remember before you those for whom life is frustrating because they're without work, because they have made poor choices in life, and they can't seem to find a way forward because what comes next does not seem clear. <clears throat> Support each one in your abundant mercy and lead them in new paths. Good and generous God, fill us with energy and compassion to reach out to those facing difficult times. And may we become the gift that we have received in Jesus, for it is in his name that we pray, saying the words our risen Lord taught us to pray and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I've got some young folks here, so if you'll come down, we'll have a special time with you. All right. He's thinking about it. There they are. I've got you. All right, I got, I got Miss Granny to come. She'll keep care of you. It makes me nervous because I'm going to be talking about teachers today. Ooh. So I better watch it. I better watch it. Come right here and have a seat. Come right here. Hey, buddy. I'm so glad to see y'all. Now, did you realize that this is a certain season of the year? This is summertime. And what do we do in summertime? Do we take vacations? Huh? You go swimming? Yeah, I love to go swimming. Any of you go on vacation? Where have you been? To who? Gatlinburg. Yes, sir. Huh? Camping? That's a fun vacation to have. And You know, that's a good thing about summer. Why do we, why do we go places and why do we enjoy summer so much? We don't have to go to school, right? Yeah. We, 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 we have to wait to get to go back to school. I'm working on it. Uh, well, as much as we love school, as much as we love to learn, sometimes it just helps to chill out for a while, not have to get up so early and get to school and not have to do all that homework. We need a vacation. We need to take it easy. And that's always a good Did you realize, though, oh, you see what I brought? Why did you, why do you think I brought an apple? Because it's summer. It's summer. Well, that's what, apples are, are grown in the summertime. But I almost was going to say when your grandparents went to school, because I realize I'm old enough to be your grandparents, but it's probably when your great-grandparents went to school. A lot of times, you know what they would do when they would go to return to school? They'd pick an apple off the tree 
and they'd give it to their teacher. To see and see how much they appreciated. And I don't know if they're trying to get brownie points with the teacher or not, but but they, they, they did it because they appreciate what the teacher was doing for them. And that's an important thing to appreciate your teachers. Did you know that Jesus was a teacher? You did, because they had a name for him called rabbi. And rabbi means a teacher. In the scriptures that we read, that it says that Jesus taught them many things. And I wonder sometimes when Jesus was teaching, because guess what? Teachers, they need a vacation too, right? But unfortunately, sometimes this year, because of all the COVID, some of the teachers have been working extra hard even all summer long. And Ms. Ms. Dulce, she's an administrator, and she never gets off, really. You know, and she added on that a wedding in the midst of this. So, you know, it's been a busy time. I bet you Ms. Dulce could use a vacation, don't you think? All right. So I'm announcing today. No. Uh, <laughs> no. But do you think Jesus tried to take a vacation? Yeah. I, there were some times that Jesus says, oh, I love everybody, and I've been healing them, and I've been teaching them, and I've been preaching them, but I need a break. So his vacation was kind of going off by himself have some peace and quiet so we can relax and rest. But guess what? Sometimes that didn't last too long because the people would figure out where Jesus was and they'd all go traveling where Jesus was trying to be by himself. Now, how do you think that made Jesus feel? Well, you think, oh, no, here they come again. That's what you would think. But Jesus wasn't that way. When he saw all these people still coming to him and still coming to, 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 to be taught by him and healed by him instead of like oh i wish they'd go away the bible says he had compassion on him. he cared about him. he loved about him and guess what what the main subject jesus would teach about over and over again is how to love that we need to love god and we need to love one another so i, I just want us in this summertime as we do some relaxing we also remember that sometimes even in our relaxing we might get a call that we need to help somebody. And and we may need to, and I bet you these teachers who are teaching during the summer, they still have compassion on you, right? And they're glad to have you and be with you. And I want us to try to figure out how we as a church can do a better job of caring for one another and learning from one another and watching out for one another, okay? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for these special folks who have come as we gather together. We thank you for the children in our lives. We thank you for those who have are hungry to be taught, uh, those who are hungry to be loved. Help us, Lord, to never forget to love others as you have loved us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for coming. I appreciate y'all. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but God's goodness is flourishing all around us, especially in this season of, of growth and recreation. The fruits just fill our lives and we enjoy it so much. Our gifts of God, our gifts to God, are a token of that kind of gratitude in our hearts because we all receive uh, from the goodness in Christ and in the creation that God has provided for us. These gifts that we offer will help God's goodness flourish through the ministries that we undertake in Jesus' name. And as we prepare to give these gifts, especially be in prayer for our ministry teams that are going to be meeting through the next several weeks as they think about how we can get back to doing what God has called us to do and to figure out what is our next step as we seek to be faithful disciples. And part of your giving today will support those ministries that aren't even happening yet, but it's in God's heart, and my prayer is it'll be in your heart as well. Let us pray. God of goodness and God of growth, receive our gifts and gratitude for the fruitfulness that you provide, and bless our gifts with your spirit so that they may accomplish more than we can ask or imagine for the sake of Christ, our friend and our Savior. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings.
to hear the word of God. Let us pray. Move among us with your spirit, O God, and prepare our hearts and minds to receive your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing you, we may obey your will and follow your ways in the example of Jesus Christ, the living word. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourself and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages to buy something for themselves to eat. But Jesus answered them, You give them something to eat. They said to them, Are we going to go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, Five, and two fish. Then he ordered them to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And all ate and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered five thousand men. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Before I lift my heavenly Father up in song, I want to thank him for his love and his mercy and his grace that he shows me daily. He is worthy of our praise, and I want to thank and praise him. The, song, the question that I'm asked a lot is, Rebecca, what song are you going to sing? And this morning, I'm going to sing about the goodness of God. And listen to the words. Don't listen to the way I sing it, but listen to the words of this song. Goodness of God. I love you, Lord, for your mercies never fail me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing. Of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You are close like no other. 
I've known you as a father And I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me With my life laid down, I surrender now I'll give you everything Cause your goodness is running after It's running after me And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness of God. The goodness of God. The God, the God of compassion. We are created in the image of God. So it matters what we think of God when it comes to us thinking how do we live and who we are and what we are about. There's a delightful story of years ago, 500 years before I was born, a long, long time ago. And a couple gave birth to a little boy in Italy. And gave this boy his name, and everybody expected that this boy would follow in the footsteps of his father and of his grandfather and be in the medical field. But as you know, sometimes our children do not always uh, fulfill the expectations we may have, right? And so we love them still. And he felt that God was calling him to serve God through the church. And so at one time he was beginning his work in the church at a great cathedral in Florence, Italy. And, and there he happened to notice something day after day, not just on Sundays, but every day of the week. There was an elderly lady who would walk into this cathedral and walk and stand before a statue of the Virgin Mary. And she would kneel in devotion before the Virgin Mary every day of the week. And he was pretty impressed. That kind of daily devotion uh, to the Blessed Mother and in fact, he mentioned it to one of the older priests. And he said, look how faithful and how dedicated she is. And he goes, ah, oh, well, don't be deceived by what you see. And he told the background of this story. That years ago when the artist, the sculptor, was planning on making the sculpture of the Virgin Mary, he searched high and low to find the person who would be the right model for his statue. And he finally found the one and he created this statue using this young lady as a uh, model. And that young lady was now the older lady who came every day to kneel before the statue that had been created in her image. You know, that may be why uh, some have said that uh, in the beginning, God created man in his image and now man has returned the favor. We want God to be like we are. We think that will justify us acting the way we do and, and being how we are. So who is the God that you worship? What is your image and your vision of God uh, that will lead you? The Spirit of God that's going to help you to decide what you're going to do each day and how you're going to reach out this day to others. What is your God like? 
William Barclay, some of you might remember him. He was a popular biblical commentator. His books on the New Testament were bought by millions. However, not everyone was a fan of his teachings. He was known at times to have some pretty controversial and sometimes unpopular positions on some of the biblical teachings. It's, and he would share these on his radio Bible study. And once he was being interviewed about his faith. And as we all do when we talk about our faith, we mention those moments that really helped us understand who we were. And the times that we found out our faith grew was not by those happy, happy, joyful times, but usually by those times that got us, God got us through uh, just barely. <laughs> and we hold on to those times. And, and William Barclay shared about the time in his life. It was a tragic day when his 21-year-old daughter was in a boating accident and she had drowned. And he, and he talked about during that moment how he experienced the sustaining strength of God giving to him during those difficult times. Well, some days later, he received an anonymous letter, obviously from someone who did not agree with his teachings. And this letter said this, Dear Dr. Barclay, I know now why God killed your daughter. It was to save her from being corrupted by your heresies. Oh, my. My, oh, my. Now, Barclay knew good and well that God didn't go around drowning daughters to punish their parents. Had he known this writer's address, which of course the writer did not give, he says he would have written back, not, not so much in anger, but more in pity, sharing the words that John Wesley once said in a sermon called Free Grace when he was talking about the logical conclusion of predestination, the thought that God controls everything we do and say. We can always blame it on God. God must have meant for it to happen. <coughs> and he would have shared with them how John Wesley said in that sermon, your God is my devil. It's sad to say, but anyone who spends much time around some religious folk will hear about a God that seems more vengeful spiteful and capricious, a being that looks nothing like the God seen in our Lord Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis, that author of Mere Christianity, recalls how he grew up believing that God was an old meanie, looking around to see if somebody was having a good time so they could stop it. Where do we get such ideas? Most likely, it comes from some people with bitter hearts. Such people worship a God who smacks his lips in gleeful anticipation of plunging souls into a lake of fire. Now, other folks go just the opposite direction. Other folks lean completely the other way. They, they create a God in their minds who is their good buddy buddy. You know, uh, a sweet grandfatherly figure who's always on their side and who will always beckon to their desires. Where do we get such ideas about God? Because God is neither an angry, vengeful ogre, easy to, eager to punish, nor is God a pliable, insecure, smiley-faced, well, bellhop or waiter, eager to always please. No. God it's God. But more than that, God is the God revealed in Jesus Christ and the overwhelming image that Jesus gives us of God is summed up into one word, compassion. You look up that word compassion in the Bible and more times than not, it says it speaks about the compassion of God. That's the word we encounter in today's text. Jesus had been teaching and healing, and now he's bone tired. So Jesus suggested that his disciples, that they slip away to get some little bit of R&R, &R, some rest. Jesus knew that this was important for any of us. Either we come apart from time to time, or sooner or later, or we'll literally come apart. 
Here they departed to this deserted place, but alas, the crowds found them still. People came by the thousands from far and wide to see and hear this man who had such an impact on their community. And when Jesus saw them, the scriptures tell us something so significant, so telling about Jesus. He was moved with compassion toward them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Well, see, that's how God views us. For all of our pride and all of our knowledge and all of our sophistication, there are still areas in our lives when we're oh so vulnerable, so uncertain, so insecure. Our hearts ache from loving and losing others. We realize that particularly in these last few weeks. Our minds are full of our fears and our insecurities about the future, about aging, about dying. We worry about our inability to get our act together, to do those things that we know in our hearts that we need to do and leave behind those things that are so destructive to us, but we keep going back to them. Not to mention all the difficulty we have connecting our lives to one another. No matter how sometimes we try to reach out to one another, something happens that breaks that connection. On his deathbed, the great philosopher Hegel complained, only one man ever understood me. And after being silent for a while, then he added, even he did not understand me. You ever felt that way? Nobody in this world understands you. There's an ultimate sense of aloneliness that kind of goes with being human. Dante, in his Divine Comedy, kind of shares about the condition of humankind. He says, "In the middle of the journey of of the journey of life, I found myself astray in a dark wood where the straight road had been lost." Such is the human condition his view. And yet God sees more for us. God doesn't leave us in that sense of lostness. God sees where we are. And God knows what we're going through. When a man came home uh, drunk again, <laughs> his wife led him up to the bedroom and she helped him undress and tuck him into bed. And being a godly woman, she knelt beside the bed and asked him, John, do you want me to pray for you? He nodded yes, and she began to pray. Dear Lord, I pray for my husband who lies here before you drunk. Don't say that I'm drunk. Say that I'm sick. <laughs> well, like it or not, God sees our condition clearly. And God has still has compassion for us. He sees us as sheep without a shepherd. How sad it is then that we tend to refuse to acknowledge our need for God. God sees and God knows when we are astray in a dark wood and when we've lost our way in life. God sees all the brokenness in our lives, the broken relationships, the, the broken hearts, the broken bodies, as well as our unfulfilled potential. And God sees us and God has compassion on us. God sheds tears over our world. God weeps over you and me. And God longs for us to get our lives back together, no matter how long we have been astray. When God sees us as sheep without a shepherd, floundering about with no sense of direction, no sense of purpose, no sense of hope, God's heart is saddened. So God did something. He did something special to make a difference in our lives. He did something significant to make a difference in our world. God sent Christ to be our shepherd. He's the one who says, I am the good shepherd. That's what Jesus said in the Gospel of John. I know my sheep and they know me. What wonderfully good news that is for us. This glorious creator God not only looks upon his children with compassion, but God has moved into this world. He's moved into our neighborhood to redeem each and every one of us to become a good shepherd to us all. So is our God an ogre? Hardly. 
Is, is our God a pushover? Not at all. Ours is a God of compassion who chooses to freely offer himself to all of us who are seeking a good shepherd, someone to lead us through the, this world each day. This is the God who has compassion. And this is the God to whom we pray. Let us pray. Where would we be, O oh God? Where would we be without your compassion? You've promised to never forsake us. Help us to hold on to that promise today. Lead us, good shepherd, throughout our days to, to places and to people who really need your love. Oh God of compassion, we give you praise for your redeeming grace. So break down the dividing walls of hostility and hatred which surround us and fill us with your Holy Spirit of reconciling love so that we too, alongside your beloved Son, can make a difference in this world today. Amen. Our hymn is an invitation for us to return back to the heart. I hope and pray that you will draw near to God as we stand and sing and as we respond to the Spirit's leading in our lives. of quiet rest near to the heart of God a place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God O oh, Jesus blessed Redeemer sent from the heart of God of comfort sweet near to the heart of God a place where we are Savior meet near to the heart of God oh Jesus blessed Redeemer sent from the heart of Trusting all to receive you. Go into this world with hope, with all the dreams which God has placed in your heart. Go into this world with love, love for all people, serving those with those to whom, with whom Christ lives and laboring for those for whom Christ died. And may the faithfulness of God, the hope that quickens God's spirit within each of us and the love of Christ be with us all. Amen.
thank you for joining us in worship at the church on the square. Whether you're members or visitors or friends, you are welcome here. We're grateful for those who join us on the radio or online. And we're grateful always for the ways that God bonds us together, the cords of love which can never be broken. Go in peace.